Okay. I'm Jane Chavatari. I spent the last three years as president of the National Book Critics Circle, and now I'm the vice president of online activities for the Book Critics Circle, which means I'm in charge of our award-winning blog, Critical Mass, and also of our social networking. So you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter, and you can go to <laughs> www.bookcritics.org and see um, what we're up to. We are a group of us, six of us, in fact, serving as stand-up critics this week for all of the Panorama Voices Festival. You will find one of us. Have you seen any of us before? Have any of you been to the other events and seen a stand-up critic? Okay, well, we're spread thin. There are six of us, and we're all over the place, and we're having an incredible time. We've been asked to give you, we know you all have books to read. We know you have big stacks of books to read. So anyway, we've been asked to give you another set of books to read. Um, and we've really thought long and hard about it, uh, each of us. We have separate lists. Um, they all are, will be online, by the way, at www.pen.org and also at bookcritics.org. Um, each of us has been asked to give a contemporary novel, a translated book, a classic, a small or independent press book, and a surprise. Today I'm making a slight twist on that in keeping with the um, nature of the panel. I'm going to offer you not my independent list of five, which you can actually see online now, but I'm going to offer you the translated books recommended by all six of us. So that's where we stand. Uh, this is the recommendations of translated books from six National Book Festival <coughs> stand-up critics. So imagine them standing alongside me here. Uh, the first is from Eric Banks. His recommendation is A Tomb for Boris Davidovich by Daniel Keith. It's published by Dalkey Archive Press. It's not a new translation, he says, but a book that one winds the experience of totalitarianism and tart prose about as tightly as the two can get under a wickedly matte sheen of black humor. I can't think of a better book to open the, the reopen the 25th anniversary of Penn's conference on the writer's imagination and the imagination of the state. Um, my, J. Chavatari, my translation recommendation is a book called Without Blood by Alessandro Barrico. It's translated from the Italian by Anne Goldstein. It's set in an unnamed country at the tail end of the Civil War, possibly the Spanish Civil War. It's an exquisitely crafted fable for our times, a novel that addresses the question behind the daily news. When is a war over? How can a soldier return to normal life? How many years, how many generations will it take to forgive? The next translation recommendation I have is from Rigoberto Gonzalez. He is offering us The Black Minutes by Morton Soleris, translated by the late beloved Ora Estrada and John Toker, published by Grove. It's a novel that defies categorization, Rigoberto says, weaving mystery, magic, and political corruption along the baffled Mexican border. The next re recommendation is from Lev Grossman, who is Time Magazine's book critic. He's offering us 2666 by Roberto Bolaño, translated by Natasha Wimmer from Ferrar, Strauss, and Giroux. This, he says, is a rare inter international sensation that is not overrated. A city-sized literary labyrinth encompassing a mysterious German novelist, a Mexican serial killer, love, hope, despair, and disappointment. It's like a Borges story that exploded. Maybe the one thing it doesn't contain is the number 2666. Then from Laura Miller, who is a Salon.com critic. Uh, her translation and recommendation is The Indian Bride by Karen Fossum, translated by Charlotte Barsland, and it's from Houghton Mifflin. Laura says that people will tell you this is a detective novel, and it is, but it's that rare crime fiction that makes the victim more important and paradoxically more alive than her killer. And finally, from Roxana Robinson, an NBCC member and also a pen board member, her translation recommendation is Madame Bovary by Gustave Flaubert, translated by Lydia Davis, it's from Viking. She says, this is a great book translated by a great writer. What more can we ask? Flaubert's mesmerizing narrative about the flawed, gorgeous Emma continues to confound us. We fall under her spell from our first glimpse of her, shadows cast on her face by silk and rain. Throughout the book, Flaubert wrestles with his own ambivalence about her, and who are we to disagree with his ambivalence? I'm going to leave you with a comment from the beloved author of Beloved, our Nobel laureate, 
Tony Morrison, who was um, with the Penn folks yesterday for a working day. And I, I jotted down one of the things she said that just stayed with me, and I hope it will with you. She said, Somet I sometimes think that authors don't know how valuable they are to bring culture to the world to make language work. And I'd like to also mention that her wonderful presentation to the 25th, 25 years ago Penn um, Congress is in this current issue of Penn, Penn America. It's one of my favorite publications. And I'm gonna introduce you to David Hagland, who is a, a National Book Critics Circle board member and the managing editor of that wonderful journal. And he's going to be the person who's moderating your panel today. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Jane. Uh, it's great to be here, and it's great to have all of you here. Um, I want to welcome you all to the Penn World Voices Festival. For those of you who are coming to your first event, this is, as you may know, one of many, and there are many more today and tomorrow and on Sunday. Um, Penn is an organization of writers, editors, publishers, translators, who are committed to defending free expression and promoting literature, and in particular, uh, literature and translation. The first Penn uh, Club, as it was then called, was founded in London in 1921, not long after the First World War, with the idea that writers could speak across borders, so why can't everybody else? Um, something like that. Anyway. And, uh, and so the panel today kind of rose out of that idea and that, um, that mission to, to share books across borders, books that have been translated from one language into another and then encountered by a reader or a writer. Uh, for, you know, potentially very far away from where that, that book originally came. Uh, as Jane said, I'm the managing editor of Penn America, which is the literary magazine that Penn publishes twice a year. And um, we've done some juggling uh, of, of uh, panelists. We had some scheduling challenges, um, but I'm very excited about the writers who are joining us here today. The first uh, one I want to introduce is Colin McCann, who is the National Book Award winning uh, author of Let the Great World Spin, as well as uh, Zoli, Dancer, The Side of Brightness, uh, Song Dogs, Story Collections. It's been published basically everywhere. And uh, Colm is going to read uh, a short piece from the new issue. Well, one of the things we did in this new issue is we asked over 50 writers to, um, to imagine that they'd been invited to you know, the greatest book swap that they could come up with. And I'll just read briefly the prompt that we, that we gave them to set up uh, Colin's reading. This is what we asked them to do. Imagine you've been invited to the world's greatest book swap. At this make-believe event, you'll join fellow writers and readers from around the world in one place, and you'll bring a beloved book to trade. There are just two guidelines. One, since literary translations make up such a small portion of what gets published in the US, less than 3%, and since Penn is devoted to fostering international understanding through the promotion of literature, Please bring a book originally written in a language other than English. Let us know which translation you plan to bring. And two, write a note explaining what the book means to you and what you hope it might mean to the recipient. Uh, more than 50 novelists, poets, translators, and editors replied, selecting books from ancient Egypt, Imperial Rome, medieval Spain, Qing Dynasty China, among many other periods and places. Uh, so Colin is going to read one of those responses for us. Okay. Uh, there, sure. So much, um, and it's, it's so nice to be here. I feel like I should be able to translate myself now at this stage because I have to. I'm triple booked um, this afternoon with pen events and, liter and literary things, and I have to. I have to run off. But it's so important to me to uh, to, to to be here, um, and I, I thought what I tried to do um, is because when we talk about translations, um, we sort of extend these these uh, wonderful uh, mirror images of our. Of our texts across across the the, 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 the languages, um, that I should not read anything uh, of of my own, but read something that was uh, written, in fact, uh, by Rabbi Almadine. Um, now, if I were to choose a book um, in translation, you know, I was even thinking about Garden Ashes, Danny Lokish there uh, just a, a second ago, or Three of Crocodiles, or something like that. But somewhat tongue in cheek. I might also choose uh, Finnegan's Wake by <laughs> James Joyce. <laughs> anyway, this is uh, the piece uh, from, uh, those of you who know Ravi's work, he's, um, he's originally from Jordan. Um, he's a spectacular author who, he lives now in um, San Francisco, um, 
and he has written a short story collection, The Perv, um, and I think three novels, uh, the most well-known of which is probably The, the Hakawati, um, which came out about uh, three years ago. He also wrote Too Late's The Art of War and I, The Divine. And interestingly enough, four writers chose uh, the book of Disquiet um, as their book for the um, sort of global, the global, global book swap, if you will. And this is what uh, Ravi had to say. Every writer in the world will meet in Lisbon, of course, lovely Lisbon with its uncertain winds. We'll stay in some old hotel overlooking the Tagus, its lifeblood. From our windows, we'll be able to see the Belém Tower at the mouth of the river and the restless wings of its gulls. We'll arrive in the late afternoon when we can gaze at the sun as it bathes the sprawling mass of rooftops in a tawny farewell. The hotel will be both beautiful and broken down, like the city itself, well, like the city as I imagine it, since I've never been there. In the drawer of the nightstand, next to the left side of each bed in every room, the writer will find not Gideon's childish scribblings, but, but the Book of Disquiet by Fernando Pessoa, one of life's great miracles. Now, if Pessoa were alive today, he'd probably object to the attribution. Even though most editions of the book, and there are quite a few, list him as the author, he didn't write it. One of his creations, Fernando Soares did, Pessoa invented numerous literary alter egos, what he called heteronyms. Arguably, the four greatest poets in the Portuguese language were all Fernando Pessoa using different names. One invented poet was a doctor and a classicist, a royalist who emigrated to Brazil. A second was an unlettered genius who lived in the country, a paisano. A third was a naval engineer, a bisexual dandy who traveled the world. The fourth was Fernando Pessoa, another invention, according to you. Pessoa, like Kafka, was a clerk, a loner, a nobody, with no friends, no love, no family. He gave up his life, not just for his poetry, but for the poetry of the other three as well, and for other poets. Pessoa created distinct writers, each with his own character and background, his own style, his own interests, his own intent, each idiosyncratically brilliant. He created poets who wrote in French and in English. One of them wrote sonnets described by the Times of, uh, of London as more Shakespearean than Shakespeare. He not only created poets, but gave them a champion, a prolific critic whose writings in English promoted Portuguese literature. He didn't stop there. His creations critiqued each other. He lived in his own world of literature. Pessoa invented short story writers, translators, philosophers, an astrologer, a baron who committed suicide, and a hunchbacked, lovelorn woman by the name of Maria Jose. More than 72 creations by some accounts. He wrote, each of us is several, is many, is a profusion of selves. The poets may have been Pessoa's best creations, but his greatest literary achievement is The Book of Disquiet, a factless autobiography made up of observations, aphorisms, ruminations, musings, dreams, moods, and the keenest revelation of an artist's soul. What makes this fictional diary transcendent is that it deals with eternal quests, the meaning of life and of death, the existence of God, good and evil, love, reality, consciousness, and the soul's disquiet. It can quench a thirsty mind and flood an arid heart. A book tells you quite a bit about its author. A great book tells you quite a bit about you. When I first encountered disquiet, I felt like laundry. The book, the book dumped me in pristine water, battered and wrung me, hung me out to dry in unobstructed sunshine, rejuvenated me. I was forced to examine the choices I'd made, the beliefs I'd held, the loves I'd forsaken, the gods I'd worshipped. The disquiet manuscript, like most of Pessoa's work, was found in a trunk after his death. He published hardly anything while alive. The translator, Margaret Jul Costa, or Jul Costa, I don't know, so excuse me, uh, Margaret Jul Costa says, perhaps appropriately, there is no one version because each edition of the book represents a selection of the papers found in the trunk and put together in a different order or according to different criteria by different people. In English alone, there are four different versions. 
It is as if the show continued to fragment into further heteronyms beyond death, and we, the translators, were those heteronyms. Peshoa lived most of his life in a single room in Lisbon, his literary alter egos and their writing his only companions. He chose not to publish, to interact as little as possible with the world, to rarely leave his room except to walk to his small office and back. He died in obscurity, a virgin and a recluse, in 1935. Whenever a writer in this old hotel feels her ego on the move, in either direction, I'm a fraud, I'm a genius, I am the best writer, I'm the worst writer, she'll open the nightstand drawer and pick up the book of disquiet. The writer, alone as she has always been, alone as she will always be, will read to remember that she is neither, that she is a mere speck in this world. Claudio Magri says that Pashoa's journeys not to the end of the dark night, but of a night of a colorless mediocrity that is even more disturbing and in which one becomes aware of being only a peg to hang life on, and that at the bottom of that life, thanks to this awareness, there may be sought some last-ditch residue of truth. I remind myself that I am a peg, that I should aspire to be nothing, like Peshawar. I am nothing. I shall never be anything. I cannot wish to be anything. Aside from that, I have within me all the dreams of the world. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations on this fantastic journal. Thanks very much, Colin. Thank, Thank you so much. Um, Colin McCann and Robbie Alamedine. Uh, I believe we've Rob Collin is doing one or two events tomorrow, so you should check uh, your your um, schedule, your festival schedule, if you've got one. If not, pick one up and uh, go see him at more. Then introduce uh, three writers uh, to my left. Um, one of the exciting things uh, for me about our panel today is that I believe all of uh, the writers here grew up speaking multiple languages. Um, so in some ways, it's the perfect group to be talking about uh, reading in different languages and reading books that have been translated from one language uh, to another. Um, to my immediate left is uh, Rahul Bhattacharya, who is the author of a book about cricket called Pundits from Pakistan, voted one of the ten best cricket books, and now a novel uh, called The Sly Company of People Who Care, which has just been published by FSG. Um, and which, uh, as I understand it, we were, we were talking about the book uh, upstairs, um, jumps from India to Venezuela to Guyana. Uh, Rahul himself uh, lives in Delhi now, has lived in multiple places. Um, next uh, on the left is uh, Natasha Apana, uh, who is of Indian descent but grew up in Mauritius. And we were talking about uh, her first language, and, I, and Natasha was hesitant to choose just one. Is that fair to say? Um, it said maybe Creole might have been first, or the mother tongue at least, but also there's a lot of French and English as well, and an Indian language or two. Um, Natasha moved to France uh, in 1998 and has published four books, uh, the most recent of which is in English called The Last Brother and has just, uh, just been published in English and won multiple prizes uh, in France. Uh, and finally, Leila Abu Leila. Uh, grew up in Khartoum um, and lived much lived for many years in Scotland. Uh, in my late twenties. Late twenties yeah. in Scotland and now lives in Doha in, in Qatar. Um, she was the first recipient of the King Prize for African Writing and is the author of uh, The Translator, a New York Times notable book, as well as Minaret, uh, and both of those were long listed for the Orange Prize and the Impact of Award. Um, She's also the author of a story collection called Colored Lights, and her new novel, Lyrics Alley, just came out in March. So what we're, what we're going to do is, um, each of the writers here today has, like the participants in the Forum on Our New Issue, chosen a book that they first read in translation. And I've asked each of them to, to bring a copy and to, to tell us a little bit about the book and how they encountered it, and to read briefly from it. And and then we'll talk about each of those books and also some of the larger issues uh, that are raised by reading and translation. And uh, I thought we would go in alphabetical order, which means starting with uh, Layla on the far left. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Going from A to B. And so all the way down. <laughs> first, second. Okay. Uh, 
Okay, well, good afternoon. Um, I've chosen to talk about um, the wedding of Zayn by Tayyip Saleh, who's the, um, um, the top uh, Sudanese uh, writer of all time. And um, uh, Tayyip Saleh is known for his uh, novel uh, Season of Migration to the North. Um, although I've, but I've chosen today to talk about his uh, novella, The Wedding of Zayn, simply because I, I love it more. And um, Taim Saleh passed away uh, two years ago, and um, there was actually a pen session um, for him, and they read extracts from Season of My Rage to the North, so that was much appreciated by <coughs> everyone in Sudan, I'm sure. Um, I feel that, that one of the reasons I love Wedding of Zayn so much is it's, it's, it's just so Sudanese. <laughs> it's sort of quintessentially Sudanese for me, at least. And um, uh, when, I was, when I first moved to Britain um, in my mid-twenties, and uh, I was struggling with a, trying to do a master's in statistics and, and with a, with a one-year-old baby and feeling rather homesick, I used to read The Wedding of Zayn in Arabic on the London bus every day to sort of block out the rain and, <laughs> and the reality of my life and sort of go back to a kind of uh, lovely world that I, I, I had left behind. Um, the story is about um, the village idiot who is Zayn. And uh, I'm going to uh, read first and then talk about it a little, bit, a little bit more. So this is a little bit from the beginning of the uh, novella. Um, also, this is a brand new edition, I must say, which is wonderful. It just came out um, last year, and it's a New York Review uh, book, so that's, that's wonderful. And it's um, translated from the Arabic by Dennis Johnson Davis, who's really a terrific translator. Um, so this is uh, Zayn, the, um, the village uh, idiot, had, has suddenly imagined himself in love with the Amda's daughter. And the Amda's daughter is uh, the, head, the head of the village's daughter. And as soon as he fell in love with her, he started shouting, oh, I'm in love, and she's wonderful, and so on, and, and going up and down the, the Nile, you know, um, talking about her attributes. And so this caught the eye of, uh, of, of the people in the village, and everybody started to look at the girl. And so suddenly, she snapped up by the most eligible bachelor in the village. And then the same story is repeated uh, again with another girl called Halima. So I'm going to start off from there. The marriage of the Amda's daughter and that of Halima were a turning point in Zayn's life. For the mothers of young girls woke up to his importance as a trumpet by which attention was drawn to their daughters. In a conservative society where girls are hidden away from young men, Zayn became an emissary for love transporting its sweet fragrance from place to place. Love, first of all, would strike at his heart, then would be quickly transferred to the heart of another, just as though Zayn were a broker, a salesman, or a postman. With his small mouse-like eyes lurking in their sunken sockets, Zayn would look at a beautiful girl and would be overcome by something that was perhaps love. His innocent heart having succumbed to this love his, th his thin legs would carry him to the far corners of the village, running hither and thither, like a bitch that has lost her pups, his tongue continually singing the girl's praises and calling out her name, so that ears were soon cocked and eyes on the lookout. Soon, too, some handsome young man's hand would stretch out to take that of the young girl, and when the wedding took place, if you looked around for Zane, you'd find him either working away at filling pitchers and large ewers with water, or standing bare-chested, axe in hand, in the middle of a courtyard, cutting up firewood, or exchanging good-natured banter with the women in the kitchen, while from time to time they fed him with titbits, and he'd burst out into that laugh of his, so like a donkey's braying. And then would begin another romance, and from each romance, Zane would emerge unscathed and to all appearances unchanged, his laugh unaltered, his tomfoolery in no wise lessened, and his legs never weary of bearing his body to the outlying parts of the village. Years of abundance replete with love were experienced by Zane. The young girl's mothers went out of their way to gain his affection, tempting him into their houses 
where they'd give him food to eat and tea and coffee to drink. On entering, a seat of honor would be spread out for him and breakfast or lunch served up in the best crockery, after which mint tea would be brought if it happened to be morning or strong tea with milk if afternoon. After the tea, he'd be served coffee with cinnamon, cardamom and ginger, be it morning or afternoon. No sooner did the women hear that Zayn was in the nearby house than they'd flock to him, for they were amused by his raillery. Mothers would urge their daughters to go along and greet him, and lucky the one that gained a place in his heart, and whose name was upon his lips when he went out, for such a girl was guaranteed a husband within a month or two. <laughs> Perhaps Zane instinctively became aware of the importance of his new status, and so began to play hard to get with the girl's mothers, and would show hesitation before accepting an invitation to breakfast or lunch. Yet with all this, there was one girl in the district about whom Zayn did not speak and with whom he never played the fool. She was a girl who would observe him from afar with beautiful sullen eyes, and whenever he saw her approaching, he would fall silent and leave off his raillery and buffoonery. If he spotted her far off, he would flee from her presence, leaving the road to her. So um, what happens then is that uh, <laughs> is that Zayn um, is befriended, is adopted by a, a wandering Sufi um, aesthetic who travels around. And, uh, and what, is, what Taib Saleh is doing is he's setting up the kind of official, uh, traditional, authoritarian kind of Islam, which is presented by the imam of the village and the elders of the village. And then the marginal characters, Zayn and the, the, the Sufi who's called Hanin. And then one, one day in a very dramatic episode in the novel, just as Zayn is about to, to strangle another man uh, to, to, to death because the, the, the other man was teasing him and abusing him. And this happens a lot, of course. He's the outcast of the village and people treat him badly and so on. So and Hanin appears, the, the Sufi mystic appears, and he, and he uh, puts his hand on Zayn's uh, shoulder and he pulls him away and Zayn cries and says, this man, I've been abused, I've been hurt and so on. And Hanin says to him, uh, don't worry Zayn, you, tomorrow you'll be marrying the best girl in the village. And uh, with these sort of prophetic words, words uh, the, 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 a lot of changes happen in the village. And, uh, and this kind of miracle is, is really very beautiful. And this is what I love so much about this novella. Thank you so much. Thank you. Leila, um, <laughs> we, were, we were talking upstairs, and I asked uh, if you remembered um, when if you had read it first in English or in Arabic. And you said, no. Either you weren't sure which... I wasn't, I'm not sure. I've read it in both languages, but I'm not sure which I read first. Huh. And, um, but I have the memory of the London. Sitting in the London bus is holding the Arabic one. Right. Defiantly. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but um, I said... Have you gone back and forth between one and the other? I go back and forth between one and the other, yeah. Is there some reason why oh, today I feel like reading it in Arabic, today I feel like reading it in English? Well, my English is stronger. I write in English. So uh, English, in that case, English would be the lazy option for me to pick it up in English. Uh, Arabic would be the, the, the more sort of slower, the more appreciative, especially of the dialogue, of course, in Arabic. It's, it's more authentic and it sounds better on the ears. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. And do you, do you feel like uh, the experience of reading those two, is it distinctly, I mean, are they the same book to you when you pick it up in either language or...? Uh, like the prose part that I read, yes, it's the same book. Once we get to the dialogue, and that's always difficult for translators, I think, the dialogue. The dialogue is more authentic in, in Arabic to me. Once it becomes translated into English, it, it kind of becomes a little bit exotic, becomes a little bit um, sort of, Meta. yes, yeah. So that's always a problem. And there's a lot of debate about that because, um, for example, in, in Arabic, we use a lot of um, expressions. Um, uh, we say what would be translated in English, for example, is, for Allah's sake, give me this. Uh, and some people, f and the translators go ahead and, and translate us, for Allah's sake, give me this pitcher of water. But nowadays, um, 
there's a movement which says, no, it should just be translated as, please give me this pitcher of water, because uh, it's sounding, you know, a little bit strange right. to say it like that, and people don't really mean it. Well, they do mean it, but they actually, because it's just, we're so used to incorporating a lot of um, religious words in our language, so that sometimes maybe when it's trans translated into English, it might sort of sound a little bit odd. Has anyone rendered that as for God's sake? Yes. For God's sake. Yeah. For God's sake. Yeah. But that would sound odd as well. If I say to you now, for God's sake, give me that yeah. picture of water, that will sound odd as well. Right. <laughs> so, so someone's not mad when they say for all this. Someone's, yeah, that's it. Yeah, just, just people say that. It's like we, when we say, um, uh, how are you? We say, uh, the reply is, alhamdulillah, thank, thank God. Yeah. Full stop. We don't say yes or no, we just say thank God, which means yes, we're fine. So how do we then translate that or not? It's, it's interesting. Yeah. Have Rahul and Natasha, have either of you read books in multiple languages? Yes. And have you encountered similar issues? Uh, I, I have to say that dialogue is a very tricky dialogue and um, uh, local kind of language especially for a writer who lives in an <laughs> sorry, especially for a writer who lives in an island, say a Caribbean writer, they have their special uh, kind of uh, uh, anglicism, <coughs> of, uh, francism, that gets uh, difficult to get, to get translated. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. And uh, Leila, you said that this book was quintessentially Sudanese for you. What did you mm -hmm. mean by that? Um, I think it's this uh, kind of uh, uh, um, this way where spirituality, this figure of the Sufi, and the way this miracle happens at night. It kind of, I mean, Sudan is a is a, has this kind of romantic, uh, crazy history and this kind of pr sort of extremism in it and. Uh, uh, when I was living there, when I lived there, it feels like living inside a novel where things are sort of exaggerated. Normal day-to-day -day life is, is not really normal day-to-day -day life. It's kind of, uh, uh, it's a bit like a, a looking into one of these strange mirrors that elongates and things like that. So I think the novel the novel captures that. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Um, Natasha, do you want to tell us a bit about the book that you've uh, brought? Yes, I've, I've chosen a book by Aaron Applefeld called uh, Beyond Despair. I've uh, read it in French, actually, and the title we were mentioning is, is quite different. Uh, in French, it's uh, L'Héritage Nu, which I would have translated by uh, The Naked Legacy. Um, Aaron Applefeld uh, was born in, uh, in Poland, and his... Um, his uh, first language is German. And then now he lives in Israel. And when he started to write, he, uh, he, he said that uh, writing about his experience of the Second World War in German was very strange and odd to him. So he learned Hebrew to, to be a writer. So um, I've, I had read Aaron Applefeld's novel, uh, non-fiction actually, he writes a novel and, and non-fiction before, but when I was uh, working on my f fourth novel, The Last Brother, it's a novel, novel about the souvenirs of an old man who, rem who remembers that in 1945, he was nine years old, and he, he's, um, he met a young boy, a, a white blonde young boy, which, uh, with whom he had a very brief but very, very strong friendship. And this young boy was a Jewish detainee in Mauritius. So it's his souvenir about his, this friendship, this fraternity, this uh, very, um, um, Every, everything separates these two young boys, their, their, their physical appearance, their history, their immediate history, and even the history of, of uh, the, uh, the big history. Uh, but still, they recognize each other, and they have this friendship that will um, 
uh, uh, um, that will uh, um, l uh, give an impact on, on, on the character's life forever. But while writing the novel, about half of it, I was getting all kind of doubts about how to write about this Jewish destiny because I, I deliberately uh, wanted to write the story with another angle because uh, most, uh, many of these Jewish detainees are still alive and I think they, 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 are, um, they have their experience, their own voice and I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not here to tell their story in their place. So, but I, I, I didn't know how to do that. I didn't know how um, the story of my character would not be um, indecent to them. And I was talking to my publisher, and he, she said, have you read uh, Aaron's Applefeld's uh, conferences? And I said, no. And then she lent me this book in French, and this book really liberated me. And that's why I, I chose that. I will read some some extracts that have have really uh, impressed and and been very helpful to me. There was no place for the individual for his pain and despair in the camps. No one there said, "I have a headache." a toothache, I'm in a bad mood, I'm homesick. In the camps, there's no place for a vocabulary with a domestic tone. The individual, or what was left of him, was nullified, and only a barren gaze remained, or rather, apathy. It is a uh, astounding how easily true life can be falsified when it is clothed in words. There can be no literature without memory, and memory is not only fact and vision and the course plotted for them, but also a warm emotion. Memory is doubtless the essence of creation, but occasionally memory, if one may say so, is also a mass in which important and unimportant things are mingled together and it demands a dynamic element to make it move and give it wings. And this is what the imagination usually does. The power of creative imagination does not lie in intensity and exaggeration as it sometimes seems, but rather in giving a new order to facts. Not in inventing new facts, but in the correct order, so that the idea of the author is visible. Uh, my book is also about children, and I was very worried how to render children's opinion, children's view of things. And Erin Applefeld was uh, only seven, seven or eight years <coughs> old when uh, he experienced the Second World War, and he, he <coughs> lived in the forest for six years. And he says something about, about, uh, about children. Thus, with no parents in enemy fields, isolated from humanity, we grew up like animals, cowed and oppressed by fear. The life instinct guided us, and we obeyed it. In the forests and villages, we felt the secrets of the secret, sorry, of our Jewishness. It was then, apparently, that the knots were tied which bound us to the flickering, flickering flame of the Jewish secret. We knew that secret made us fair game for every hand and axe, but without it, our existence would be more meager. Yeah, I, I, I just how this really liberated me, and I wanted to read just a short extract of my book, where the two um, where the two boys are, are in the forest, and it will be their the last night for us, for for them.
The sky was a carpet of stars, and I felt safe there. This was the night when David sang, and now I am in the winter of my life, and I can in all honesty confront what I did, what happened to me, what I deserved and otherwise. What I can say is that for me, his singing was one of the <coughs> most magnificent things that I've, I have ever heard. At the prison hospital, I used to hear the same lament in Yiddish, and it seemed to me that they came from people's heart at the same time of day, when all is dark and the stars are out, when the Jews, when the Jews were alone and could no other than confront their own lives and hold fast to what they have been in the past. Someone would begin the singing and others would join in never very loud, never at the top of their voices, never in protest, just a murmur through the lips, a caress on the tongue, a bare melody softly brushing the vocal, folds, the vocal cords. And apart from this, apart from this music that hovered that prison with its dirty, ignoble walls, nothing stirred. And it was like a secret they were sharing that linked them from note to note, from refrain to refrain. I was amazed that even the weakest of the weak sang from the depth of their beds, but after all, perhaps they, the ones that were most sick, were the ones that who needed it the most. Thank you very much. I want to make sure we, we have enough time both to, to hear Rahul and then also to um, take questions from, from all of you. So. Um, why don't we, we turn to you, Rahul, and then we'll revisit uh, some of the things that have come up. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, well, the book I've picked is uh, Chronicle of a Death Foretold by Gabriel Garcia Marquez. And um, I almost pick uh, La Frangier by Camus. And then it occurred to me that both these are very slim books which center around the murder of a man of Arab extract, and I wondered whether this revealed something very dark and disturbing about me. <laughs> and, and seriously, uh, they're very different books, and perhaps Camus is uh, the more powerful work because it sort of descends into the depths of an individual and his pointlessness, uh, whereas Marquez is completely different. It sort of mines the collective conscience of a uh, community. And uh, the situation is this, it's the situation is, uh, is that of uh, what in India we sort of charmingly refer to as an honor killing, uh, which is a very chilling term for a very barbaric act. And uh, the, uh, the circumstances is that this actually happened in Garcia Marquez's village. There was a very rich man who rode into the uh, town one day looking for a wife. And he found one, a beautiful girl who was the daughter of a butcher. And he married her with incredible celebration, and the entire village participated in it. And everybody was uh, drunk and happy and all of that. But a few hours after the wedding, uh, the man returned the girl to, to the family. It turned out that she was not a virgin. And uh, to avenge this great humiliation, the, the twin brothers um, of the girl decided it was their duty now to kill the man who they think had deflowered the girl in the first place. And uh, so the, the, and, and they find him and they kill him. And this is the story, this is the book. It's the recreation of that event. And it's, it's, it's brilliant and dazzling in the sort of kaleidoscopic way it does this. It mines the, uh, the memories of people, the stream of coincidences and contradictions the hallucinations, uh, actual official records, all of that to piece together this murder which has uh, actually tormented the village and uh, is, is all they spoke about for years. And uh, like I said, Marquez was part of this community. He was, uh, he was the cousin of the girl uh, who was humiliated and the boy, the boy who finally got murdered uh, was Garcia Marquez's mother was his godmother, so and he was a part of the friend circle who was sort of carousing that night. Except that I think Marquez was himself in a whorehouse at the time of the actual murder. <laughs> or so he says in the book. Uh, it took him about three decades to return to this story, 
because he realized <laughs> he hadn't found a way of writing about this. Um, and he realized the missing ingredient in this whole story was that the, the twin brothers who committed the crime, they really wanted somebody to stop them. Uh, but nobody did, because it was the matter of a social code. And so once he figured this out, and he could introduce this narrative who moves up and down through time, and sort of, there's a beautiful line I read in a review of this book where he takes this murder and then dangles it like a sculpture in the breeze. And so you can just see it from all angles. And the part I'm reading from is at the very end of the book. This is the actual physical description of the murder. It, it doesn't spoil anything because the fact of the murder is known in the first sentence. And everything, all the events leading up to it, and all the people's motivations, and even the sort of consequences, both the immediate consequences and the distant consequences of this uh, have been very forensically examined. And finally, when you read this description, it's sort of, you're in a daze. So I'll, I'll start now. Santiago and Nassar only lacked a few seconds to get in when the door closed. He managed to pound with his fist several times, and he turned at once to face his enemies with his bare hands. I was scared when I saw him face on, Pablo Vicario told me, because he looked twice as big as he was. Santiago Nassar raised his hand to stop the first strike from Pedro Vicario, who attacked him on the right side with his knife straight in. Sons of bitches, he shouted. The knife went through the palm of his right hand and then sank into the his side up to the hilt. Everybody heard his cry of pain. Oh, mother of mine! Pedro Vicario pulled out his knife with his slaughterer's iron wrist and dealt him a second thrust almost in the same place. The strange thing is that the knife kept coming out clean, Pedro Vicario declared to the investigator. I'd given it to him at least three times and there wasn't a drop of blood. Santiago Nasser, twisted after the third step, his arms crossed over his stomach, let out the moan of a calf and tried to turn his back to them. Pablo Vicario, who was on his left, then gave him the only stab in his back and a spurt of blood under high pressure soaked his shirt. It smelled like him, he told me. Mortally wounded three times, Santiago Nasser turned frontward again and leaned his back against his mother's door without the slightest resistance, as if he only wanted to help them finish killing him by equal shares. He didn't cry out again, Pedro Vicario told the investigator. Just the opposite. It looked, it looked to me as if he was laughing. Then they both kept on knifing him against the door with alternate and easy stabs, floating in the dazzling backwater they had found on the other side of fear. They didn't hear the shouts of the whole town, frightened by its own crime. I felt the way you do when you're galloping on horseback, Pablo Vicario declared. But they both are, uh, suddenly awakened to reality because they were exhausted and yet they thought that Santiago Nassar would never fall. Shit, cousin, Pablo Vicario told me. You can't imagine how hard it is to kill a man. Trying to finish it once and for all, Pedro Vicario sought his heart, but he looked for it in, in, in almost, sorry, he looked for it almost in the armpit where pigs have it. Actually, Santiago Nassar wasn't falling because they themselves were holding him up with stabs against the door. Desperate, Pablo Vicario gave him a horizontal slash on the stomach and all his intestines exploded out. Pedro Vicario was about to do the same, but his wrist twisted with horror and he gave him a wild cut on the thigh. Santiago Nassar was still for an instant leaning against the door until he saw his own viscera in the sunlight, clean and blue, and he fell on his knees. After looking and shouting for him in the bedroom, hearing other shouts that weren't hers and not knowing from where, Placida Linero, who's his mother, went to the window facing the square and saw the Vicario twins running toward the church. Hot in pursuit was Yamil Shayum with his Jaguar gun and some other unarmed Arabs, and Placida Linero thought that the danger had passed. Then she went out onto the bedroom and saw Santiago Nassar in the front of the door, face down in the dust, trying to rise up out of his own blood. He stood up, leaning to one side, and started to walk in a state of hallucination, holding his hanging intestines in his hands. He walked more than a hundred yards, completely around the house, and went in through the kitchen door. He still had enough lucidity not to go along the street. It was the longest way, but he went in by the way of the house next door. Poncho Lanao, his wife, and the five children hadn't known what had just happened 20 paces from their door. We heard the shouting, the wife told me, but we thought it was part of the bishop's festival. They were sitting down to breakfast when they saw Santiago Nassar enter, soaked in blood and carrying the roots of his entrails in his hands. Poncho Lanao told me, what I'll never forget was the terrible smell of shit. But Arherina Lanao, the oldest daughter, said that Santiago Nassar walked with his usual good bearing, measuring his steps well, 
and that his Saracen face with its headstrong ringlets was handsomer than ever. As he passed by the table, he smiled at them and continued through the bedrooms to the rear, of the rear door of the house. We were paralyzed with fright, our head and Alda now told me. My aunt, Winnefrida Marquez, was scaling a shed in a yard on the other side of the river when she saw him go down the steps of the old dock, looking for his way home with a firm step. Santiago, my son, she shouted to him, what has happened to you? They've killed me, Vene child, he said. He, he stumbled in the last step, but he got up at once. He even took care to brush off the dirt that was stuck to his guts, my aunt, when he told me. Then he went into his house through the back door that had been opened since six and fell on his face in the kitchen. Thank you. So, uh, Rahul, putting aside uh, any dark, murderous impulses of your own, do you have some sense of why uh, well, one, do you remember when you first read uh, this book? And two, do you have some sense of why it uh, really struck you and why it stayed with you? Well, I mean, there was a time where I used to be sort of anal and write where I bought books from and what day. So it says April 2003. And, but I came to Marquez in quite an odd way. I came to serious literature quite late, actually, because I was playing cricket and entertaining the idea of studying pure mathematics. And, uh, I read one day that in the newspaper that Fidel Castro had uh, uh, sort of talked up Marquez. And uh, I asked my editor at that time at the cricket place whether he had some Marquez on him. And he said, of course, and he gave me 100 years of solitude. And I read it with the same sort of stupor that any young reader reads Marquez. But I don't have that much affection for that book as I do for this. Uh, because this is just, uh, it's a masterpiece of craftsmanship. Uh, Marquez says that himself that literature is basically carpentry, and I agree. And this is an exquisite, exquisite piece of carpentry. And skill like that, artistry like that, craftsmanship like that is universal. And uh, uh, in terms of literary structure, I think it, it's just so taut and concise, and it's so precise in its detailing, and yet so sort of poetic. And uh, it's a triumph of both uh, literary structure and as well as a sort of investigative journalism of its of an odd variety. Uh, and it's very much its own book, as uh, you, you won't find another book like this. Uh, but looking back on it, I also find, found a lot of themes in this which I could sort of relate to Indian life. The whole idea of honor killing, the whole idea of people doing something they don't want to do, but they think that uh, they expect it to, to do to sort of fulfill a social good. Uh, I, it, it spoke quite strongly to me about, uh, I mean, you pick up a newspaper in India and every day and you'll find that a girl has been killed by her own parents because she has uh, participated in a marriage they didn't approve of, somebody outside her caste or outside her community. And uh, the, the society looks on. It has the sort of blessings of the community. And it's a, it's a, uh, it's a very chilling thing to encounter. And, uh, and it, uh, some of this is sort of re removed from our urban reality. But it's the way, I mean, this book is set in the village, and a lot of these uh, uh, cases in India are set in the villages, and where it has absolute complicity of everybody involved. Uh, have any Indian writers that you know of taken that subject on? on? I've read about it quite a lot in journalism. I can't remember reading literature about it. But you, you said something interesting uh, upstairs, which I, I wanted to ask uh, Natasha and Leila about as well, which is that I, I was confessing upstairs that I, I really only know English, and I've never gotten very far in any other language. And Rahul said, oh, well, then you fully inhabit it. And, and, and then explained that what he meant was that it's easier, he thinks, to fully inhabit a language when it's the only one you know. Yeah, well, because I have five or six languages, four or five languages in me, and none perfectly. And well, I come from uh, some of my Bengali relatives are here. My father was from a Bengali family, and my mother was from a Gujarati speaking family. And my childhood was in a town of South India where the state language was Telugu. And my, I studied, I went to school and studied like a good colonial in English. And we moved to Bombay where the state language was Marathi. And now I live in Delhi, which is the capital and uses the popular Hindi language. So, <laughs> it's hard enough just remembering the names of these languages, let alone knowing them. And, and though I consider English my first language in some ways because it's the language I, I read and uh, I wrote in, and I continue to write in, I don't feel, I don't feel a completely natural fluency 
with it. I have to, when I'm, because when I'm talking with my friends in India, even if I'm talking in English, it's a very different English. It's a mixed up English of jumbled up words, personal references, different registers, borrowed, you know, borrowed phrases, all of that. And when I talk, in, when I'm meant to speak in well, pure English or whatever, I have to think, I have to apply myself. And I have to do that while writing as well. I feel I have to actually construct those sentences, which is why I agree with the, the thing about the carpentry. I can't write as I speak. Or, right. Though I'm trying to little, yeah. I mean, but on the other hand, maybe you could bring that into your work. When you're writing fiction in particular, are you trying to bring that kind of mongrel quality of your own linguistic I, yeah, it, it is. Well, in some ways it is exciting because it's the truth <laughs> of the modern world, this sort of mixed up languages, mixed up identities. And the book, uh, the novel I did, The Sly Company of People Who Care, is set in Guyana. And that has, uses a lot of mongrel English. And some of the English you, uh, that you hear in the Caribbean is sort of very vivid and exciting because they've come from, uh, they've been derived from African rhythms. They have loan words from Dutch and Portuguese and French. And they have their own sort of creation <coughs> and the phrases. And uh, so uh, uh, the idea of, uh, so well, the interesting thing that somebody asked me when, when I wrote that book, and a lot of it is in, in dialect. And they asked me, why did you write this? Do you think anybody in India will be able to understand these kind of dialogues? And, but I thought that Indians are used to translating mentally anyway, because they're dealing with so, lang so many languages all the time. And there was this la there's a dialogue in, in the book where a Guyanese says, uh, uh, don't speed me head in the morning time by, which basically, don't speed my head in the morning time, which means like, just don't make me angry. Don't speed me head. And it's a beautiful visual term. And Layla, when you're writing, I mean, do you, when you write, you write in English. Yes. But you grew up speaking both English and Arabic. Mm -hmm. And are you conscious of that as you're writing, or do you have a feeling similar to Rahul's, or? Um, well, no, 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 it's not as complicated as that. My, my mother tongue is, uh, is Arabic, um, that is actually colloquial Egyptian Arabic. Um, because Arabic, the Arabic that's written, the written Arabic is not the same as what we speak. Most Arabs speak um, a, a kind of the colloquial, and it's different in different countries. But then when, you have, when the written text is the same everywhere, it's classical Arabic and everywhere, and everybody in the Arab world uh, recognizes it. So that's what I got taught at school, uh, the classical Arabic, and then the, the spoken was, was Arabic. But, um, but because I went to, to, my education was in English, I mean I did history in English and everything in English. And, um, and I did a lot of my reading in English, so that's why when I came to write, I came to write in, in Arabic. Uh, in English, sorry. But then when I'm, I'm writing about, about characters who are speaking in Arabic, and so I am translating. As I'm writing, I'm translating from English into uh, I'm translating from Arabic into English, when, especially when it comes to the dialogue. Right. And so I'm making decisions, you know, of how to translate this. Or uh, if I like something, I translate it uh, sort of literally. If I don't, I change it, and, and so on. And and my my new novel, um, Lyrics Ali, is inspired by the uh, the life of my uncle, who was a poet. And so I've translated his poets, his poems, also into English in, in, in the novel. Uh, so, that's, yeah. so even when you're writing your own books, you're translating them as, as well? I'm translating, yes, yes. And then there are certain things that uh, people say colloquially that I like, I like to translate. I mean, in Sudan, we say, uh, we don't say make a sandwich. We say stuff a sandwich. That's, that's, that's how it's said in Arabic. And I use that in the book because I thought it sounded nice. Right. <laughs> yeah. The sandwich sounds nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And Natasha, you, when you're writing in French, do you have a sense of that you're kind of taking all these different languages that you grew up hearing and then? No, actually not really. Uh, uh, I'm, that's why you, you asked me what's, what's my first language. I, I, I couldn't say because I, I make a difference actually between mother tongue and first language. I would say that my first language is French, but my mother tongue is Creole. Um, my yeah, my I grew up in a family where uh, actually the common language was Creole, but my grandmother spoke some one Indian language to me, and um, my mother, who is a teacher, she would out of nowhere speak French or English to me, and 
my father too, and at school we learned uh, English and French. So, but I, I never actually thought of writing in Creole. Writing to me was always either in English, either in French, and then the books I wrote, I, I read, made me write in French. But uh, now that I live in France, I, I, I speak French. <laughs> Come on, come on basis, but I, I work for an NGO and I write articles in English, so I, I still get to practice. But it's it's a, it's I think it's a it's a, like identity changes all the time uh, because we like Rahul said we have that in us. I have, um, I have a small uh, girl; she's two years old. And when I, when I was pregnant, everybody was saying, "Oh, what what language would you speak, <laughs> speak to her?" And I had no idea. <laughs> I had no idea because I. I and I, I, I was saying to my parents. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would know. I know that I wanted to speak one language, not 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 mix. Um, and uh, I, I would say to myself, I will I will wait until well she comes out and I'll. And it was French. Mm. My first uh, thing to her was <laughs> in French, so I, I I speak French to her. So that's that's a bit of a. My mother tongue, because I'm a mother, so it's my <laughs> mother tongue. But when I get her to sleep, I I sing a Creole lullaby to her. So that's a bit strange, you see. It's a right, yeah, yeah. There was a, there's a right, and I'm now I'm in a blank on Atik Rahimi uh, was here um, at the festival last year, maybe the year before, and he was talking to uh, Laila Azamzangane, and he um, has written uh, both. He's written in a couple of languages. He'd written a new novel in French. I'm going to get this right. He'd written a new novel in French, I believe. And he, he thought he would write it in his, his mother tongue, and which I'm now, I know he's from Afghanistan. I'm blanking on what his mother tongue is. But the, the novel was very sexual. And he said um, it felt wrong. To write to write a book like that in his mother tongue, and he actually <laughs> won the Gold with that. Yeah, he won the Gold yeah, with right, that. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I, are there more things I'd like to ask all of you, but just so to make sure that we have enough time, I'd love to turn it over to the audience. If people have any questions, they can just raise their hand, and I'll uh, try to see you. Yes. Who was the translator of the Marques? Oh, uh, the question was, who is the translator of the Garcia Marques? Uh, Gregory Rabasa. Rabasa. I think he must be some sort of genius because. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> I, and I think Marquez said of 100 Years of Solitude that it reads better in English than it does in Spanish. <laughs> but, but I think this man must be almost as big a genius as Marquez. There's uh, one of the pieces in the journals um, by Jaime Manrique writing about uh, Don Quixote. And I think, it, I have to read it again, I think he says that he thinks it's better in English. Uh, as well. Uh, I saw a couple of other hands right here. What was the title of the Marquette book again? It's called Chronicle of a Death Foretold. Chronicle of a Death Foretold. Yeah. Someone else? Yep. I remember as a very young girl being impressed when I heard that in Eskimo language there were over 200 words for the word snow. <laughs> And thinking that um, you know, something must get lost when we simply say snow. And I'm wondering if you have that experience with language, that certain languages have this wonderful array of nuances. And then when you translate it, you lose that. And, and how, if you have experienced that, Um, I don't know if that answers the question, but I, even being uh, um, considering French as my first language, um, when you don't have that as your mother tongue, there are some uh, sub, uh, sub some words or uh, not really different words, but this, the the way you say the word means. <coughs> different things and I think that in translation sometimes like I, I see here um, the, the, the word plaisir 
in, in France can mean many different things. It can mean uh, just the joy, it can mean also the uh, sexual uh, pleasure, and I think it was not well translated in my book, but well, that's my fault because I got to read it. So actually. <laughs> and um, when, when I was, when I just came to France, I did many mistakes like that, saying uh, words that I thought were good for that sentence, but I totally meant, or I, I use a different term, so that, that also can be tricky. I find that in Hindustani, which is the sort of lingua franca of India of sorts, it's a mix of Hindi and Urdu, uh, there are like a whole bunch of words for love, and all of some of them which have Sanskritized roots and some are from Urdu or Persian Arabic roots, and all of them sort of suggest something very different, um, a li different levels of desire or respect or baseness or whatever, or just passion. Uh, I, I find that I mean, I'm sure they don't have 200 like the Eskimos, but uh, I think you could, I could think of at least six or seven words for love which convey a different type of passion. Yeah. Uh, Rahul, because you yeah. write about cricket so much, yes. which is a game of both colonial but also indigenous uh, yeah. references and terms in the sport, <coughs> have both English, I think, and other languages <coughs> references. Does this relate to your fiction writing in any way, or at least your linguistic life? Uh, no, because the the sort of the cricket community is just sort of it's a very closed and complete community. It's no, it knows everybody knows everything inside that. Yeah, the language of cricket, as they say, and it's just in, unintelligible to anybody outside the game. <laughs> the terms and references, the rules, and even the rhythms. And of course, Americans never stop reminding us that uh, it, it's just absurd to be playing a sport which lasts five days and you don't have a winner at the end. <laughs> uh, uh, but I find uh, it's sort of, it is a language, the, the cricket lexicon, and uh, well, uh, a cricket, a former cricket editor is right behind you, and she'll be able to, from Britain, and she'll be able to tell you about the many sort of dictionaries of cricket terminologies that come out every year to try and educate the rest of the world about this mysterious code of having people feeling at silly point or forward short leg or whatever. But it, it, I think you have to be born into it, <laughs> really. I want to follow up on a great question. There was a novel published here a few years ago, and I'm blanking on the time. Nether uh, Netherlands, Netherlands by Joseph O'Neill. I'd like to know your reaction to that book. <laughs> <laughs> I think others have loved it more than I did possibly. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I like to get parts a lot though, actually. Some of it. Mm. It didn't, it didn't, well the thing about uh, books and languages, so much of it is dependent on the actual rhythm of the sentences and whether you sort of uh, feel a part of it or not. And at the time I read it, I didn't. Uh, I'd like to sort of revisit the book sometime now because I know a lot of people whose judgment I respect a lot have liked it very much. But and that I also, the thing about Netherlands is it was actually more a book, I mean I know it was pegged as a book about multicultural New York and post 9-11 and cricket and all of that, but I thought its emotional core was about a failing marriage or a failed marriage or, and had just read Revolutionary Road by Richard Yates and you can't match that, right? <laughs> that just sort of lays that topic bare so brutally and uh, vividly that um, after that you know, just seemed like, okay, they had a few problems. <laughs> but, but, but because Richard Yates had just a few months ago or a year before, I just sort of just got into my head and uh, dissected the anatomy of a, of a marriage and, and yeah. Anyone else? Yeah? I'm just wondering, uh, whether different languages will inform you or be source of different kind of imagination or memory or taste or emotion or kind of different mindset, I don't know. So are you, so with, with each of them, whether they remember certain things in one language or another and or... source for different kind of writing or... Well, I find that when I... Um, when I, I write in English, of course, and so when I want to write about um, um, 
any kind of spiritual um, aspects or Muslim practice, it's, it's hard to write about it in English because the English words don't have the same meaning. I mean, if I go to the dictionary, for example, and I want to um, tr translate the word, uh, the Arabic word taqwa, that's in the in the in the thesaurus in the in the in the Arabic English dictionary. That will lead me to uh, piety or pious. Then you go look in the thesaurus, and someone who's pious is a bigot. So it's not the same word in Arabic. In Arabic. Uh, taqwa will always mean, uh, you know, respectful. To always be mean, God fearing. So, so I can't write pious. I can never describe one of my characters as pious because then the reader will just hate them. Because in English, the word pious is just a baddie straight away. So, you know, and then the other thing, if I'm describing someone who's praying, and then they go down and they put, you know, the that's called pros pros. And, and that sounds like you're sick or something. <laughs> so I can't use the word either. So I've got so many words that I can't use, and I have to make my own language. You know, so sometimes I would then describe it physically. I would have to say he knelt down, put his forehead on the ground, and you know, the ground was the grass was wet or anything like that, just to get to give the reader a sense of it. Because if I say prostrate, the reader is just going to go off in a different direction. We've got time for one or two more. Um, so I'll familiar hand up over here. If not, it's just doing well, David, uh, yeah. Colin McCann has come on, but I, the, the Ferdinand Pichot piece was so beautiful. It's great, right? And it, it yeah. made me almost inevitably think of an entirely different source, the New Yorker source, of Joseph Mitchell and Joe Gold's Secret. But the Ferdinand Pichot was the real deal. Right, right. And uh, there's a funny, uh, funny thing about that, which is so there, like I said, there are about 50 something writers who who chose a book, and we let them choose any book as long as it's a translation, at least four of them chose the Book of Disquiet by Fernando wow. Ochoa. Yeah. It was easily the most uh, popular. Uh, there was some Calvino and some Borges, but for whatever reason, Ochoa seemed to be speaking to a lot of people. Um, yes? Did those authors choose the same translation? Because there are several I Ochoa you know, translations. I did. There were yeah. a couple of translators who were mentioned, and there was at least one of them who actually said, oh, I read it, this translation, but this one is also good. <laughs> Um, so yeah, we, we, we tried to make sure everyone uh, in the forum mentioned the translator that they and you know if they knew of multiple editions to mention that too because it does it takes different forms um, and uh, you know they they if they're reading different editions they are reading slightly different books. So. Anyone else? Fran? Did you read any books that got your culture wrong that you wish you had not read? Huh. <laughs> My God. Well. I, as I explained to you, my culture is, <laughs> like for many Indians, is, is so unique because the thing about Indian <coughs> lives is they come from like a matrix of community, caste, economic status, profession, all of that. And then, so everybody's location on that is, is like a, quite a distinct thing. Uh, but I've, I've read books about, about India, I, I don't know actually, I can't think of any, I have to be honest. Uh, I I, come cr I encounter it much more in journalism, in in reports, but I haven't I haven't read that many books by about uh, India by outsiders. It that makes me think, yeah. makes me think of the the Appelfeld uh, and why you turned to it that you felt like you you, you wanted someone to give you some guidance uh, yes. in, in writing about this this other culture that you felt some responsibility. Which also makes me think of kind of the larger moral argument for publishing work in translation, which is that it does allow us some access to the sort of emotional and psychological life of a culture of a people that we otherwise might not know. Which makes me wonder, especially with the two of you, Leila and, and um, Natasha, whether you feel that responsibility yourself as writers when you're sitting down. You think, oh. People may read this book who have, who know very little about Mauritius, for instance, or know very little about Sudan. Actually, I have to say this is my greatest fear because uh, in France, uh, Mauritius is a very touristic island. So um, 
I wish I couldn't say. I, I, could, I wish I, I hadn't put I was uh, was from Mauritius because uh, it's, uh, I always get someone who says, "Oh, I've been to Mauritius and uh, the beaches are marvelous." And uh, are you right there? Why? Why do you do that? I thought you were swimming all day. You know. <laughs> so I have to say that it's it's hard to. To say, well, you know, you can be serious too. You can, uh, you can, ha you can, you can read or. <laughs> uh, I, it's incredible the kind of uh, reaction that you can get when you say you are from an exotic island. Right. Right. Yeah. Said, um, yeah. Yeah. You, people just expect you to just, you know, come out in it. Bikini. <laughs> 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 yeah, they don't expect you to write books. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. no, I just wanted to add to my uh, answer to your question is that one of the problems about why a lot of writing about India, whether by Indians or outsiders, just sort of rings false is because it's already writing in translation. Uh, yeah. Because you're depicting a reality which is, which is lived in many different languages and many different registers. And uh, on a daily basis, I would have transactions with people in three or four languages and different registers among those. And there's, there's no way that you can... And then you have the terms. And each, I mean, to call dal uh, a lentil soup, as many writers do. I mean, it just it looks ridiculous on the page straight away. <laughs> and uh, so that's one of the challenges about writing in India, is how do you begin to... It's a technical challenge. I mean, apart from the broader challenge of depicting a sort of society as uh, multitudinous as India's, the technical challenge of how do you depict the reality of these, uh, how do you sort of surmount these linguistic challenges. And so even where people might have got the facts right, and they've got everything right, it just rings false. It just feels like not real, it just feels like someone has actually translated your reality. And so it's, it's, that's the most daunting part about writing in India, and maybe that's why I've set my two previous books in other countries. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Leila, if I could just broaden the question for you somewhat. Uh, I think we were speaking a little bit upstairs about not only uh, the question of, of writing about Sudan, but also writing about Muslims and Muslim women for readers who may have a very close-minded idea of, of uh, this group of people and a kind of uh, monolithic idea of this group rather than have a real sense of the cultural variation within the religion. I wonder if that's, again, something that you think about as you're writing, that this is a responsibility that you have? Well, not as I'm writing, because um, as I'm writing, I mean, the novel itself has its own, its own world when <coughs> I get into it, and, and you know, it, it has its own rules or its own sort of space, and so I have to be true to that. But uh, it, it is a motivation, it is a motivation to, to that, 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 um, uh, that I, I have to say, I feel that I have to say, as I saw it, I have to bear witness to what I have experienced growing up. Uh, at the same time, when I realistically think, uh, I, I can never compete with the media. I mean, if, if the media has decided that Muslim women are oppressed, no matter what I say, you know, I can never compete. Um, you know, how many people read my books and how many people read the other kind of books that will say. So, so that this then also takes away a little bit of my responsibility in a way because then I can't really take myself so take this so seriously, given that you know I'm only reaching a small amount of, of people. But um, right. yeah, so there's a sort of freedom in that. It, like, it is. Yeah. There is freedom in that. Well, um, I want to make sure uh, that I have time to say thank you. Uh, both to all of you, but also certainly to our writers, and maybe we can give them all a quick hand.